So, uh, so we're here to welcome Peter Eisenman. Uh, debating Christopher Alexander in the early 80s, Eisenman concluded with a perfect assertion of his architectural, or I would say even his lifelong ideology. I'm not good at doing imitations, unlike Tony Vidler last week, so you'll just have to bear with me. So what, what Peter said is, what I'm suggesting is that if we, if we make people so comfortable in these nice little structures of yours, that we might lull them into thinking everything's all right, Jack, when it isn't. And so the role of art or architecture might be to remind everyone, uh, remind people that everything isn't all right. And I'm, not con and I'm not convinced, by the way, that that is all right. As an architect, writer, said you said that. Oh, I said that. <laughs> Stay on, you, it's not your turn yet. As, a, as an architect, writer, educator, and theorist, Eisenman's turf has been mission critical. His job is to reveal the critical role of architecture. Along the way, he's been largely responsible for making architecture itself an intellectual project. His commitment to architecture as an unsettled and unsettling practice has made him an architectural impresario, consistently and constantly inciting and supporting the research and production of previous, current, and subsequent generations of architects. What's the matter with architecture for Peter? That more architects don't stick their fingers straight into the belly of architecture itself. Eisenman received his Bachelor of Architecture degree from Cornell, his Master's of Architecture from Columbia, and an MA and PhD from Cambridge University. While his dissertation, The Formal Basis of Modern Architecture, which was written in 1963 but published 46 years later in 2006, which analyzed examples from Le Corbusier, Frank Lloyd Wright, Alto, and Tarani, while this, this dissertation reflects Colin Rowe's influence, it also reveals how early it was that Eisenman expanded formal analysis beyond the purely compositional to explore the structural possibilities of architecture, presenting formal principles that he hoped at that point could be universal. He's modified this belief in universality since then quite a bit, but I'd point out to the thesis students that reading Peter's thesis and looking at his subsequent work reveals a lifelong project. In 1963, Eisenman returned to the US to begin teaching at Princeton. In 1967, he formed the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies, the IAUS, the most important architectural think tank of its day in Manhattan. Eisenman's goal was nothing less than a complete theoretical regrounding of the project of modernism. He hoped to achieve this goal by combining intense formal experimentation and rigorous intellectual speculation in one space, quote, between the university, the museum, and the world of practice, where young architects could develop vanguardist agendas in the manner of the European avant-garde of the 1920s and 30s. The core of the Institute's theoretical project was a refutation of functionalism as an ideological motivation for design, as a myth in architectural history, and as a mode of cultural explanation. It was not a corpus of texts, but the systematic promotion of architectural reflection that the IAUS contributed to architecture culture. By incubating the very idea of theory, it successfully ushered theory into American institutions that were traditionally resistant to any form of intellectualism, the art museum, the design school, and the architectural profession. For this reason, the institute can properly be considered the birthplace of contemporary American architectural theory. In 1982, Eisenman left the Institute, it would fold four years later, to turn his attention to building. Recent projects include the Cardinal Stadium in Phoenix, the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, which he presented here last spring, and the City of Culture in Santiago de Compostela, Spain, a one million square foot six building arts complex, which he'll show some re very recent images of today. On a more personal note, uh, I worked for Peter right after I graduated from college. I actually knew very little about architecture at that point, uh, despite a degree from a fine institution. But Peter would challenge me constantly, prodding me to draw, to read, in short, to pay attention to architecture as well as to culture at large, especially fiction and film. While working for Peter, um, I got a clear answer to what's the matter with architecture. Architecture itself is what matters. He's been prodding and challenging me and everyone else who studied, ever studied or taught with him ever since. He is, I would say, hands down, the best teacher in our field. He starts every conversation with what you quickly learn is a rhetorical question. Hey, can I tell you something? After which he proceeds to tell you a lot. Well, please join me in welcoming Peter to the School of Architecture and letting him tell us something that only he can. 
on the lateness and the end of crisis. Uh, I have a rule that uh, I never speak at the same place in, in a five-year increment because uh, I never have anything new to say. And um, uh, I'm breaking that rule because of my friendship with Sarah and Ron. Um, I even canceled a very important meeting in Spain and told the, my client that I wasn't coming because I had to come here. It was a, you know, a move that at 50 years old you wouldn't make, but when you're over 75, it don't matter. Uh, because what they, they can do is, is get rid of you, uh, which they probably would like to do anyway. Um, I want to correct, I, I, I hate to get it wrong, but my whole life work has been a, a starting with my thesis, a critique of Colin Rowe, and it was the first attempt I made to get out from under Rowe. And Rowe, in a very interesting essay, when he, uh, the introduction to Fred Coder and Susie Kim's book on their Coder Kim, uh, talks about genius loci and zeitgeist. And of course, he a, imagines uh, a persona for each of these uh, people. And I am the uh, uh, animation of zeitgeist, which he hates. Uh, I am the personification of the zeitgeist. So uh, my thesis was in an, an attempt to uh, open that discussion up with Roe. I had traveled with him um, to Europe and I'd made a list of buildings that we needed to see and uh, the first we stopped and, and looked at, at the style architecture that is the Fanella factory, the Cineac theater, the uh, San Astral uh, uh, sanatorium by Bivot and Dacher. He'd never heard of Bivot and Dacher. By three days, by going to see, actually seeing Rietveld himself, uh, by the end of three days, Roe was ballistic, right? He hated this stuff. Uh, and what I realized as early as 1961 is that Rowe really didn't like modern architecture. And he didn't like it because it was a zeitgeist architecture. And if you go through uh, the history of my generation, uh, we uh, were, in a sense, played out a, a game of genius loci versus zeitgeist. And even though you may not spell it that way and you may not understand what those terms mean, I think they are the metacritical terms that, that take over modernism, classicism, postmodernism, uh, projective and whatever. They, because of architecture, falls into either space, uh, which is, uh, or place, uh, which is genius loci, or uh, zeitgeist, which is time. Now, of course, uh, uh, Siegfried Gideon set up this notion that space-time were the parameters of a modern architecture as opposed to place. And of course, uh, we get then uh, the Venturis uh, talking about uh, no longer space, but uh, signage, surface, uh, the decorated shed as opposed to the duck. Uh, and um, uh, so architecture plays out uh, in this country. I, I don't want to uh, talk about lateness, uh, even though Sarah said that's what I'm going to talk about, uh, because I'd rather do a kind of a state of the union, uh, since it is, uh, uh, or <laughs> the state of, of, of our uh, discipline, which I think is, is in, a, in a very problematic uh, condition. One, because there are very few uh, architects 
that understand the situation uh, in the socio-political economic condition that we find ourselves in. So I'd like to talk about the expansion of capital and what that has meant to what I consider to be thinking or theoretical uh, architects. And uh, Rem Koolhaas has made a, a, a similar observation in, a, in a, an interview that he gave uh, at the opening of his building at IIT, uh, now titled Oedipus Rem, uh, which is a very interesting title. But he gave a commentary which I spoke about uh, at Yale on Saturday, and I'm, I'm very interested because I had a discussion with Moneo uh, about this on Saturday. We were on a, uh, on a panel together that there have been three phases of capital. Uh, the first phase of capital would be the early phases of, of the modern movement, not so much in the 20s, but in the 40s, when modern architecture uh, came to the United States just after the war, came to the English-speaking world. England had not had much, it had been a continental phenomenon. Uh, but it came uh, not as uh, the good society, which was uh, uh, the social uh, condition that it was argued for in the 20s and 30s, but it came as the good life. That is, it became symbolic of modernity. And after the war, everybody wanted to have a modern uh, headquarters building, a modern factory. And so you find uh, the states, uh, especially Connecticut, Massachusetts, in certain areas, littered with modernist buildings uh, of the late 40s and early 50s that are now empty hulks. Uh, that no longer service uh, the kinds of uh, large companies, AT&T, Bell Labs, uh, you name it, the communications companies that wanted modern architecture because they needed to project an image of a new society, a new life, let's say. <laughs> and <clears throat> you can argue that when Colin Rowe said that Chicago is Hamilton by day and Jefferson by night. He was talking about rationality versus uh, uh, the, its uh, expression, individual expression. But basically, he was basically talking about zeitgeist, which was how business operated, versus genius loci, the suburban um, uh, idea of uh, around Chicago, and of course, Clearly, Houston has a similar phenomenon. Uh, Philadelphia has a similar one. Uh, most of the large cities in the United States are Hamilton by day and Jefferson by night, or uh, Zeitgeist uh, by day and Genius Loci by night. Um, so uh, what happened was that when Mies came to the United States, and he's a very good example of this, and he's a, an architect, I think, split down the middle between uh, whether he was a zeitgeist architect or a genius loci architect. We have to remember that in 1924, in a magazine called G, or Gay in German, uh, the number three issue, Mies said the famous uh, aphorism, architecture is the will of the epoch translated into space. Uh, and of course, Colin used to always argue, how does the uh, will of the epoch know how to translate? Uh, of course, which is a fairly good question and an anti-Zeitgeist uh, question. But six years later, uh, at a speech given for the jo Deutsche Werkbund in 1930, Amis says, we need to have a German architect. And of course, that uh, is very scary, as we know what follows. Uh, but Mies is saying we need to have genius loci now. And if we look at Mises' projects all the way through, we never find a Piloti project. Uh, we find columns and an open plan, not a free plan. Uh, but we also find podia. That is, that Mises' buildings, by and large, 
are located not on the ground or in the ground, but on a podium which uh, creates a, a special place. And these were all arrogated to having a special place. So that you could argue Mises is both genius loci and uh, zeitgeist. You can say the same for Adolf Loos, whose Muller House in Prague, for example, is a white cube on the outside, which is zeitgeist. You had to have a white cube and has these beautiful haute bourgeois materials and, and furnishings on the inside, a comfortable lifestyle, not modern on the inside, which is genius loci. So Loos is split, Mies is split, uh, uh, Wright is genius loci, Corbu is zeitgeist, and you can go through uh, the world articulating uh, people in, in this way. Mies comes to the United States, and uh, before, I mean, he's always done small-scale projects. He uh, takes on corporate clients, and of course, the most famous of not, not just the Armour Institute as a, as a client, uh, but the Seagram building. Uh, and the Seagram is also, by the way, even though it's set back, is also located on a podium. So it's, it's not quite modern architecture. And it's also a symbolic project in that it breaks the line of Park Avenue uh, buildings breaking that line, uh, which breaks the idea of avenue, were previously referred to symbolic religious St. Bart's and other uh, buildings. And so Mies comes to term in, in the 1950s, let's say, with what I would call the first generation of capital. That is the expansion of capital into a world of culture whereby uh, the, there is a necessary relationship where culture was antithetical to capital in the 20s and 30s, and there was an aporia uh, in the 40s when the war. The war um, pretty much capital fed Skid Morrowings and Merrill, uh, Kevin Roach, Eero Saarinen, uh, and I.M. Pei first started out working for Zeckendorf. Uh, there was this marriage of, of the initial burgeoning of post-war capital. You could argue that Mies was able to transcend the problematic uh, that capital presents. And in, Sarah, you will note in the pages you get, there is this argument underlaying uh, the project, uh, that lateness is a project of how one deals with late capital, in a way. Um, the Venturis come along, and it's not merely postmodernism that we're talking about. It's, uh, I think, dealing with a second phase of capital. And how do you do that? Because you no longer, you're no longer strong enough. Capital has become uh, more widespread, uh, and uh, it's not so much interested in high culture anymore as it is in, in reaching and through advertising, uh, and media now comes into play, uh, pop culture. And so the Venturis, you could argue, uh, and the shift from uh, what I call a, a zeitgeist argument uh, because POMO is a zeitgeist argument. There's no question, even though it's not modernist, it is also a zeitgeist. And Strada Novissima, which is a, a, Portuguese, a Portuguese argument uh, in, the, in 1980, is the zeitgeist of, of postmodernism. So you could argue that uh, Venturi's complexity and contradiction is a zeitgeist argument. But when we get to learning from Las Vegas just four years later, we are into uh, genius loci. And we're into uh, the importance of, of the place and the strip and the street and signage and communication and meaning. And all of this for me uh, would be what I would call an accommodation with capital and an attempt 
to make, meet capital's demands uh, so that they could uh, exist uh, with what their project was and capital could also exist. I think by the time we get to, and that's, let's say, the 60s, by the time we get to the 80s, um, <clears throat> something, the, th the third phase of capital, we now have uh, the, the Far East, uh, China, uh, Japan as, as players, and we have in the third phase of capital uh, something else, that the scale of the project has changed incrementally. That is, we, when Frank Gehry did Bilbao, it was an, an individual building. We were to design in Santiago, the project I'm going to show you today, a response to Frank Gehry was no longer a single building, it was six buildings. Uh, and it was no longer a uh, 100 million euro project, it was a 700 million euro project. And, you know, we have architects designing cities for three million people in China. You know, how do you design a city in, in terms of three million people from scratch? Even Le Corbusier's project may have been for 100,000 people at best. Uh, so that we're asking, an, or the Plan Obus for Algiers, any number of those projects. We've had an incremental increase in the scale of project. And even if you can argue, and as I have in, in, in my thinking about Mies, the scale of his projects increased in a very interesting way. Uh, when you go from uh, the 50 by 50 house to the Mannheim uh, project, it's the same project, but blown up in scale. Uh, even the, what we're talking about, the, the one-story buildings. Uh, and there's something even uh, approaching this expansion in the scale of doing things that, that is a, an enormous change. And whereas you could have in the scale of even Mannheim structure behaving and looking like structure, by the time we get to Seagram, we have the cladding of structure that is the symbolizing of the structure because the projects themselves cannot reveal, as it were, uh, their uh, innate structure. So I would argue that what we're, what's happening now is an enormous increase in the scale, scope, and, and uh, we can no longer have the same kind of symbolism and signage that the buildings are now becoming what one could call uh, decorated ducks. Uh, that is, they're no longer decorated sheds and they're no longer merely ducks. They have become decorated ducks. And uh, I think this is a problem that architects trained uh, in a fairly classical way uh, that is uh, with uh, what Rowe would call character and composition, whereas composition was a plan and you'd work out a plan and the elevation would have a character that either related as a genius loci or to a zeitgeist uh, or to the plan uh, arrangement. Uh, now, the scale of project, uh, the scale of build is so large that uh, we can no longer merely do uh, those kinds of ideas of character and composition. We have to have icons of enormous scale. And if we look at Rem's work uh, as a, a symbolic of this change, Rem is moved from doing, whether they were uh, genius loci projects or Zeitgeist projects, the scale of their in adventure, let's say, uh, was in their basically hermetic uh, understanding of the project, whether it's in the Bibliothèque de France, whether it's in Je Suis, uh, uh Library. Rem's work, it was very different at a certain point uh, than it is the, the, uh, the, the house outside of Paris, the outside side of Bordeaux, 
there was a scale and an intensity, even in the, in the Chicago project, that suddenly with uh, Seattle, with Porto, we have a different REM. We have a REM that is no longer able to internalize the, the architectural strategy, but it becomes part of uh, these new kinds of ducks, where REM never did ducks before. And REM would argue that uh, his work uh, is about not an accommodation with uh, capital or a transcendence with capital, but an, an ignoring of the project of capital uh, as a theoretical proposition. And he would argue that his manifesto, uh, Junk Space, is an answer to this. His uh, concern for shopping and his uh, strategies about the particular places, the genius loci places that he's dealing with, like uh, learning from Lagos, learning from Rome, learning from God knows what, uh, uh, St. Petersburg, are uh, manifestations of uh, a, a, a journey and a turning away from uh, capital. I'm not as convinced as Rem is of, of this strategy, and I think though that it puts a very interesting uh, relationship between Mies, Venturi, and Kulhas as three uh, practices, let's say, uh, bringing us to the present, uh, which deal with the question of either genius loci or zeitgeist or capital. Now, I want to suggest that uh, I think both terms, genius loci and capital, I mean, and zeitgeist, are basically metaphysical terms. And architecture, uh, as Jacques Derrida once said to me, is the locus of the metaphysical project. And I believe that the problematic that faces architecture today is, in fact, is it the locus of the metaphysical project? And uh, if so, uh, how does it deal with that? If capital is one aspect of metaphysics, which it is, um, how do we as architects project, do anything? Uh, what do our buildings look like? What should they look like? Uh, how do we in fact design? And in fact, I don't know the answer to those things. I just know that the terms may be problematic. One, in terms of, of how we sign. Um, I think that architecture has shifted uh, from the iconicity of space to the iconicity of surface. And part, again, of the paper that I've delivered to you today, Sarah, uh, has to do with the politics of surface. Uh, and uh, we know many instances of, of surface becoming, instead of space, the iconic milieu of, of architecture. Um, uh, is surface uh, a zeitgeist phenomenon, or is it a genius loci phenomenon? That's a, an interesting question. And I would argue that to understand surface, to understand the, the whole issue of parametrics today, uh, we need a new series of categories. Um, I'm reminded of two possible strategies for rethinking these poles, these dialectical pairs. One is in Tony Vidler's uh, book on the uncanny, and the other is in Jacques Derrida's book, Specters of Marx. And I want to talk about, for a few minutes, the difference between the uncanny uh, and the specter. Um, the uncanny, uh, as it is in English, is translated from a term unheimlich in German, which means unhomely. That is a disturbing condition of, of, of being at home, 
being not at home at home. And of course, home is the genius loci. So uh, we have a, a twisting of that particular term from a positive uh, idea to a problematic one, if not negative, but one that challenges the question of, of comfort, of home, as an ideal type. And I think the uncanny does that very well. When we go to the idea of the Geist, and, and we have to remember that uh, the original notion of zeitgeist was a term like genius loci, which was genius speculi, which was the spirit, as it were, uh, of the century of the time. And it was Johann Herder in the late uh, 18th century that changed from genius speculi and genius loci, that pair, uh, to uh, the, the idea of zeitgeist. Now, if we look at Derrida's book, The Spectre of Marx, what J Jacques says, and we need this, this definition between the spectre and spectral and the uncanny is, is key, I think, to where I want to take us tonight. Uh, Jacques says that communism was basically uh, on the wane uh, as, a, as a political, social, and economic force uh, by, eight, uh, by 1989 when the Berlin Wall came down. But the minute the wall came down, the minute there was no longer East Germany, the minute the communist regime in Russia uh, no longer existed, he said that we had what he calls the specter of Marx, that suddenly that idea became more potent without its physical reality. In other words, without its real being, it became uh, much more potent as a memory, uh, as a spectral memory. As is my want, uh, I always like to talk about film because I think film and, and art and literature do more to open up for architecture uh, the possibilities of its being. Uh, I went to see a, a new film by Michael Haneke called uh, The White Ribbon, uh, which won the Cannes Award first time for Haneke. Uh, and unlike his other films, which I love, uh, which are all about the problematic of meaning, uh, whether uh, uh, they are in the film Hidden or Code Unknown, they all talk about the impossibility of knowing, of, of, of knowing truth, of any kind of transcendental meaning. And uh, White Ribbon is really interesting because it sets up some of the same thematics of unknowing that Hidden and Code Unknown do, but in a very, very different key. And I think this is, for me, what uh, I'm interested in how that key comes into architecture. Because first of all, it's a film that has no uh, soundtrack other than voices and two moments when two children's choruses sing. There is no music in the background, whereas his other films do of this. So there are moments of enormous silence. And silence plays an incredible role. Second, it's a film that was shot in color and through the technology available today, the color was drained out to produce a black and white that's not the same as black and white film. So there's a, a sort of a sense of the specter of the old black and white, the, the, the incredible film noir uh, shadows and, and bright contrasts of the 30s and 40s. There is a sense of that but it isn't that, it's, it's something else. And uh, to see the camera focusing on architecture uh, and, and, and watching architecture when there's something else happening in the plot that we know is important, 
but all we're doing is looking at architecture. And a series of events, because something has to happen in a film that's uh, almost two hours long, uh, events happen and you begin to think you're in a modernist uh, mystery like who done it. Uh, and of course that is the, the archetypical genre of modernism was the mystery story that you and the author uh, were able to work together, he planting clues for you so that you, if you're watching carefully or reading carefully, uh, could work out uh, the project. Um, but when you get to the end of the film, you realize the film is not about solving the many mysteries, the many mysterious things that happen. They are mysterious, but uh, there is no answer. Uh, of course, uh, the film concludes with the news that the Duke of Sarajevo in 1914 has been shot. And of course, we know the echoes of that uh, reverberate through this project. And so what we realize is that we're watching a film that is not about the present or the past, but a haunted by our knowledge of the future, that what's going to happen in this small German town and who these people are going to become. And we get clues of their behavior, uh, which are very innocent in 1913 and 1914, but when projected forward into the future, uh, they become quite sinister. So I would argue that this of all other films, like The Spectre of Marx, is haunted by a future condition, not the past. And I think it's a, an amazing film. You, you really sit on the edge of your seat. Uh, it's be technically beautiful, etc. But we're talking about the capacity to have two-dimensional or visual imagery project the quality of another Geist. And uh, so uh, the, uh, the spirit, let's say, that Gropius was, I mean, that Mies was talking about in 1930 uh, became known as a Volksgeist. That is not the will of the epoch, but the will of the people. Uh, and we know where the Volksgeist went. And I would argue that this Geist uh, if uh, we were to take it from German and there is nobody, we're not talking about this, would be an Anungsgeist, which is the, the specter of uh, past, present, and future as an agglomeration of, of something that is not scary, because we're not talking about uh, geists in the scary sense, but something other than the zeitgeist. It is not neutral about the condition of the world, and it's certainly not neutral about the socio-political and economic conditions that we find ourselves in today. I want to close uh, this part of what I have to say uh, with uh, by, uh, talking about an essay by Paul DeMann called Semiology and Rhetoric. And what uh, uh, Deman argues is that there is a possibility uh, within semiology that rhetoric uh, can come before the grammar that is needed to deploy it. And that, in fact, rhetoric has the potential to elaborate its own different uh, grammar. Now what we know is that, for example, most of the times uh, rhetoric uh, follows from a grammar. In other words, you have to articulate a grammar um, uh, as in the, 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 the copy books of the 19th century, uh, Vitruvius's 10 books, Alberti's 10 books, all elaborated a grammar which then led to a rhetoric of the Renaissance, led to rhetorics of, of neoclassicism and, 
uh, the French Republic and, and eventually the German Republic and uh, all of these kinds of revolutionary issues. But I was very taken by Demand saying is, maybe we should begin to think about finding a grammar uh, evolving out of a rhetoric. And of course, uh, Corbu, you could argue, laid out a grammar in the five points and the four compositions before there was the rhetoric of a house as a machine to live in. But they gave him the possibility of the machine image. I would argue that there are plenty of rhetorical conditions that exist today. Uh, one of them is this Anungsgeist, uh, the other is the, uh, the new conditions of, of genius loci, and that perhaps the way that architecture can find itself without necessarily even thinking about capital today uh, is to investigate these particular issues. That is, what are the grammars uh, that uh, come out of the particular rhetorics of the issues that we have? It's the only way I know how to teach because when I present a problem uh, to the students uh, as we did uh, last fall, um, Sarah was there. We gave the students for the first time a rhetorical project. We gave them an image that was projected in Venice in the 16th century by an architect named Alvise Cornaro. There were three islands in the, in the Venetian Bacino. And we said, These, this rhetorical project, it wasn't a grammatical project, had a natural island and a classical island and a fountain, represented an attitude about Venice. It allowed Venice to see itself in a way differently than, it, than medieval Venice and projected a different view of how Venice was to think in the 16th century. That is different in its commercial aspect because it no longer was the trading capital. It had to move to the Veneto and to the land and of course uh, the Palladian Villa and other uh, conditions followed from this. And so we gave the students and said, if you were doing a project in uh, Venice today, how would it have the rhetorical strategy of Cornaro's project? And so we asked the students to produce a rhetoric, not a grammar, uh, because we said, how would you, what would be the rhetorical moment that would lead to a grammar? And I basically feel that we need to define the rhetorical values of our arguments before we can define the grammar to articulate uh, that rhetoric. I believe that's where we find ourselves in a moment in time. Uh, it's the state of the Peter Eisenman Union. Uh, it is the state, I believe, of my union with uh, my knowledge of architecture. Um, it's that using modern grammar doesn't work anymore. Using the postmodern accommodational grammar doesn't work anymore. We're no longer in those moments. And so I feel that we need to search within the rhetoric of today for a potential grammar. Now, having said all that, uh, in a free form, uh, I hope it makes some sense. Uh, I'm going to show the latest slides of Santiago, which I haven't ever viewed. Uh, we, at seven o'clock this morning, uh, put them in. Uh, some of the ones you will remember from, I believe I've showed some of them here, I may not have. Uh, I remember some of the pictures, but some of them are quite new. Uh, I only show it to you, one, because it's a project that concerns our office right now. Uh, we're finishing, there were six buildings that we won in a competition uh, 10 years ago, uh, 11 years ago now. Uh, and uh, we have been 
through three different political regimes uh, building these buildings. We will open four of the buildings. This is, uh, Santiago is one of the three major pilgrimage sites in the Catholic Church, Rome, Jerusalem, Santiago. This year, which is the year when uh, St. James or Santiago's birthday falls on a Sunday, which happens uh, twice perhaps in a century uh, or three times, um, uh, we will uh, experience in Santiago some 10 to 12 million pilgrims uh, for a very small town of about 60,000 people. So it's a very important uh, year. This is a secular project intended to marry the religious and the secular aspects of a, of a contemporary city. It's called a city of culture. And four of the buildings will open uh, during the course of this year, probably in October. Uh, and um, next week I'm going, we've already started the fifth building and building the sixth. It is not an example of what I'm talking about, only in that it is a too large project for the place that it's at. Uh, and, you know, it needed to be a blockbuster. Uh, you can't have a book anymore unless it's a blockbuster book. You can't have a film anymore unless it's a blockbuster film. You can't have an, a museum show unless it's a blockbuster show. Uh, and so we are in a blockbuster culture. And how, I, the only thing I could argue about is we attempted to deal with this project as if it wasn't a blockbuster, that we dealt with it as six individual buildings and six buildings that broke scale down from the gigantism of today uh, to the individual. Uh, that might be the only thing that we consciously did, and you will see a lot of small-scale moves that uh, radiate throughout, uh, both in terms of the overall uh, six buildings and in terms of the individual buildings, that there is a sense that, yes, this is an opera uh, or a symphony, and it has several movements. Uh, it has six acts, let's say. Uh, and they're tied together by some narrative string, but it's nothing more than that. Uh, it's not uh, uh, a Gesamtkunstwerk like uh, The Ring that Wagner attempted to do for opera at the same time. Um, it is not a, a thousand page book, uh, which is a big work. Uh, it's a, in a sense a series of, of small works, I would like to think. Uh, and um, I'm going to show some of the, the pictures tonight uh, because I think it's always, you've got to back up what you talk to talk with the walk. And uh, this is a long walk that we are involved in. So with that having been said, do I do, is that the thing that I use? No, no, that ain't it. I'm pressing the laser, but I don't see nothing. Maybe you do. He's <laughs> getting it. Okay. Here. Here. Oh. <laughs> Ding, catch. Um, this is the competition model we made. You have to understand that a lot of competition has to do with strategy. We were up against REM. Uh, Danny, Jean Nouvel, Stephen Hall, all of the sort of uh, great figural makers of architecture. And uh, I thought there's no way we can beat them. They're, they're far more talented uh, than Rem always says that I'm a B-movie architect and I agree with him. Um, <laughs> I, I like film noir and B-movies a lot. Uh, anyway, so we knew we couldn't beat them at their game. And so we wanted to make a non-building project. So this was on the top of a hillside. And what we did was to make, cut the top of the hill off, uh, put the functions in and then put the hill back. Uh, and we, we sliced it 
according to the five pilgrimage routes that would come that are downtown. We used the plan of downtown, placed it on this. I'm not going to go through the whole history of the project, but they were supposed to be non-building buildings. Uh, there happened to have been eight uh, at the time. We now we built we're building six. John, you got one. Thank yes. you, sir. I I do have one in my bag. It's this, it's this top button. Top button. Okay. I I, I can. And I point it toward the screen, is that right? I think so, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, good. Uh, I need one of these to wave around because everybody does that. Uh, oh, when they lecture. Okay, next please. Um, here is the, the state of the project today. Um, this is an archive building. Uh, this is a library building. Uh, this is a, a research institute building. This is a museum. Uh, and then you can just see the beginnings of an opera house here. Here's the foundation wall. So it will fill in that mountain-like quality. And here is the beginning of the foundation of the sixth building, which we're going over, which is another museum building. So here is the building. It is actually... Uh, a million and a half uh, square feet on the ground. Uh, uh, it always keeps growing. Uh, and the, these buildings there, the tails you can see of these buildings always go all the way back to, in fact, the road. So the, uh, the buildings are quite uh, large in themselves. Next. Uh, and now the view from the other side, we can see this is the uh, archive building here and the library building here and we're going to look through we're first going to look through the uh, archive building then the library then the research building over here and finally uh, this uh, museum building um, uh, it's built with local stone or it's the first building I've done uh, with stone and uh, it was important to me because we were you will see how the, the roof is constructed up close uh, which will surprise uh, you because uh, you don't see any ducts or vents or any kind of idea that this is a roof of a building because it's all below a three meter high uh, scaffolding that is erected and uh, to hide all of those things. And every one of these stones is a, uh, about, I would say, a meter square with four grommets on each side. And every one of them are laid in and screwed in to this uh, substructure by hand so that every piece of that roof is put in, uh, uh, as it were, by a, a worker. Next. Uh, and uh, this is looking uh, at these two towers. Uh, they were done by my close friend, John Hadep. John was an art Catholic, uh, had a, a great feeling about uh, Santiago, um, was, um, uh, had written a book of poems about Santiago, um, and near the end of his life, he lost faith in, in the physical being of, of life and also the church. And so he designed a church without a body. And this was the facade, as it were, of the church. On his deathbed, I promised John I would build this uh, project for him. And we built it first, a glass tower and a stone tower. And if you stand uh, on axis between these two towers over where this person is, and look through the, the towers, they frame the towers of the, of the actual church of Santiago down below. So that was a very important moment for us, the pairing of this church uh, without a body and the actual uh, pilgrimage church. Next, please. Um, a, a dusk twilight shot. Next. Uh, and you begin to I'm pushing the wrong button. Yeah, wrong 
Here you go. I had the wrong button. Hey, you know, you got it, John. I, I mean, told you the time. I'm not yet. I'm not good with technology. You, you I had Sarah today. I had to send a message to my wife. I'm not even sure she did. But. Uh, these things are very important. Uh, the kinds of uh, lines that run through from the inside to the outside, both in terms of paving and in terms of the soffits in the building. Uh, that both the soffit is a plan and the paving is a plan, and they're different plans. And the juncture between them is the uh, the space that uh, sort of, let's say, conceptually uh, connects them. Uh, next, please. Um, this is uh, inside the archive building. Uh, it has a glass floor, uh, and a lot of women don't like to walk on this floor. Uh, which I don't understand, but you know, it's, you, know you have to be really uh, a, a real prevert to uh, think about the floor as glass and women. But in any case, that's not what we were thinking about. Uh, but don't ask me why we did it. I think for the kinds of reflections uh, and the play between the the soffit and the and the floor that is part of the. It is a kind of mnemonic device to remind you that the soffits and the floor uh, play together. And so here they are in reflection uh, uh, playing together. And it's, it's quite a strange uh, experience. Next. And uh, again, the glass floor is also scored with many of the lines and I Again, don't want to go into the strategy of the lines because we'd be here for days. Next, trying to control this building is really uh, interesting. Uh, you will see there are square columns. There are uh, a 16 meter grid, an eight meter grid, a four meter grid. Uh, there are the stone patterns that align with these different grids uh, to the scale of the columns and then a different kind of gridded uh, pattern with the lights and uh, reveals uh, in the uh, ceilings. And these all pick up the <coughs> lines of the pilgrimage routes. Uh, that's why these uh, uh, some curves uh, are the pilgrimage routes into downtown Santiago. Next, please. Uh, another picture from the uh, archive building. Next, uh, I think it's great with people we're, you know, just being able to get people in, uh, but you can see the clashing systems that uh, work uh, uh, separated by this particular uh, staircase, the round columns that you can see and the square columns over here. Um, uh, next. I was reading a very interesting story by Gary Kasparov, the chess master, who was saying, talking about your generation, uh, that uh, uh, he used to tutor kids how to play chess with a grandmaster, but now they have $50 uh, computer programs that beat uh, grandmasters, and that little kids of 10 and 11 have grandmasters to play against at home. Only one problem, he said. And that was that the kids were beginning to play like computers and not like people. And of course, that is one of my problems, what I'm trying to say about this, is uh, some of my students are turning into parametric processes. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, they are no longer uh, challenging the computer uh, or the game, uh, they have become the game. And so that's a, uh, a warning uh, for the future. This is a project that still had human intelligence, I would like to think, or something you might call human involved in it, uh, as opposed to uh, these new uh, chess masters that are coming up. Uh, that was just a little aside whatever it's worth. Uh, you algorithmic monkeys. Next. Uh, 
yes, I do believe certain things, and I do have pet peeves, and algorithms are one of them. Uh, next, this is now we're going to talk about, this is the space, uh, we don't have it finished, it's a drawing of the space between uh, the archive building and the library, and we're going to look at the library next. Next, uh, this is that wall uh, of the library. Uh, and there are two kinds of stone. The stone, a whiter uh, quartzita, quartzite stone, and a reddish uh, color, which comes from the region, uh, laid up in very intricate patterns, uh, all with uh, uh, the same square stones. A lot of texture and contrast. Next, here's the uh, inside of the library building. Uh, again, you can see the, the eight meter grid, the 16 meter grid, the, the, the circular columns and square columns and playing. And the facade is three layers deep. I think I have a shot of one of the facades, but they're not curtain walls. They're, they're uh, very different uh, relationship. And, and we have a, a facade out here, and then we have another internal facade here. Uh, so that a lot of the spaces are, as it were, between facades and facades are not merely surfaces, they become uh, spaces in defining uh, uh, not the edge of space, but becoming space themselves. Uh, next, please. These, this is one of the buildings that will open. Here's that interior facade, uh, the exterior being over here. Uh, again, separated by a staircase, and there are four levels. There's a level up here for people down here, uh, across and down again, so that there is in section, very similar for me, very much involved with the Pyrenaean carchery uh, as sectional uh, attributes uh, to these buildings. Next. There you can see the upper level and the uh, facade and then the interior facade uh, compressing into it. Next, and I, I particularly love the, the, the glass inside uh, next to the solid uh, and the play of these spaces. Um, did we know it was going to come out like this? No. Uh, is this good or bad? That's time will tell. Uh, it is an interesting experience to be in these buildings. I can say that. Uh, next, a more calm uh, bookshelves in the uh, uh, rare book room. Next, again this interior facade next to the books and the columns. Next, the exterior facade. Next, looking through uh, the glass of the down to the level of the rare book room. And then up there's the facade out there. Next, uh, this is the uh, research building, uh, which we're going to look at next. This is the tail of the opera house that I talked about here is the foundation wall for the opera house. This is for the pit. There'll be a 1600 seat uh, full uh, opera performance, grand opera, uh, in this building, uh, a place where there is no history of opera. Going to come, but that's not my job. Come and make, make an opera house, and, uh, build it, and they will come. Uh, next, um, one of my favorite fuses is the back of the opera house uh, and the uh, research building over here, and the history museum in the back. Next, this is the interior. Uh, Again, some of the same thematics of the research building. Next. And here you get the uh, view of the 
the museum building in this facade, which twists uh, from inward sloping through uh, 90 degrees to outward sloping. And there are three levels of, you'll begin to see it later, of, of the way the glass slides in. The subframing for the glass is quite uh, extraordinary uh, in its uh, complexity. Uh, next, please. There you begin to see it, uh, looking at the, each, each piece of glass is, is uh, scored and, and made on a computer and sent to the, the factory. Every piece is different, but, uh, uh, and if you're off by in a, a couple of centimeters, which the first crack at trying to understand how to do this glass, it all had to be redone because of the uh, complexity of the, uh, of the, the curvature of the glass. Uh, didn't match the, the openings that were there. Next, uh, here's a shot that I particularly like. Again, the exterior surface, the, the soffit, and then the interior uh, facade. This is, again, uh, will be finished uh, this October. And they all have a different uh, stratagem operating within them. They have similar ideas and, and others that uh, are conflicting. Next. You don't know where the facade ends and the other facade begins because they're constantly twisting through each other. Next. There you can see the beginning of the subframe for the uh, uh, soffit. The different levels of the facade from out here to in here to the interior facade. <coughs> so we have surfaces space. Next, again, you'll see here you see the soffit, uh, the major stair connecting the levels of the of the museum exhibition. Next. And here you begin, there you see a view of the subframe uh, with all of the ducts and things that will be hidden below it and the beginning to place the uh, stone uh, panels to make the uh, stone, uh, as it were, facade roof. Next. And there you can see uh, uh, one of the riggers working on uh, placing stone so that the subframe, uh, the, the, this is the waterproof roof, and these are just laid up with uh, bolts and grommets, and they, they rock freely, as you can see, that they, they, they don't provide any waterproofing at all. The waterproofing is inside and, and uh, runs down. I think that may be it next. I think that's it. Oh, there's the final shot. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, this is an arena of 12,000 people uh, here. Uh, so uh, the cathedral downtown is here. Uh, and so you can see the scale of this project uh, is uh, a blockbuster in, 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 in many senses. Um, thank you very much. Sarah has a question. I actually do. I was going to open the floor first, but uh, I'll start with mine, okay? Yours is m much more difficult for me. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to know, actually, was how does a rhetorical project today, or maybe at any point, avoid um, being a, a project of, of iconicity or branding, even if you think of the Cornaro project in the way you describe it as offering a new view of Venice, that's essentially what branding does. So if you can make that distinction, I think it would be helpful. Well, it depends 
uh, if rhetoric is tied to capital as its project, then it's branding, I would argue. Uh, I mean, branding has to do with advertising, with media, and in a way linked to, I mean, our, our, our media today um, is trying to untangle itself. In other words, we look at a Nike commercial, and half the time I say, what is this advertising? Because what they're trying to do is detach the brand from the commercial. They want you to watch the, the, the images. Uh, ESPN does the same thing for their commercials. You don't know what they are. Sometimes they're college mascots. Uh, sometimes they're basketball players uh, sitting in a van. There's one where one of their broad... If you don't know who these people are, you haven't a clue what these advert commercials are about. And the more, more and more you're beginning to see commercials which fragment the, the brand, which fragment the image, which fragment the meaning. And, and uh, there's one guy that comes on for eight seconds. Uh, you don't watch a lot of uh, NFL, but uh, on commercials, there's a guy comes on and says, I want to tell you about taxes, and then disappears. It's not even enough. And you say, what is this, a mistake? But he keeps coming on, and you don't know what he's representing or advertising, right? And sometimes there are animals that pop up behind him. It's the most amazing thing. <laughs> I mean, uh, I watch uh, commercials because they're the more, most fun, but I don't believe that you're finding a tie between sign and signified. And of course, one of the issues of the overcoming of the metaphysical project, which is in this, is the breaking down of that necessary sign signified relationship, which would tie rhetoric to its meaning, let's say, to its form, to its grammar. And what we're trying to suggest is, is that relationship any longer a one-to-one -one relationship? Yeah, but even that example is tied to capital. I mean, it's... It is... No, no, it's... it's <laughs> hey, it's tied to capital, yes. <laughs> but I'm sure you all have more questions. So. No, no. I mean, branding is certainly tied to capital. Right, and, and the rhetorical project, I think, necessarily will be. But... <laughs> Ava. Thank you so much, Peter, for uh, your nice introduction towards where we want to be or where we are. Um, if you, I think your first explanation about this intertitling or crusading relationship between uh, what you call zeitgeist and Jenkins Lobby, right? And you see that you established these four different periods where some of them were interacting and or interacting much more with the generation of capital. And you avoided to use the ism, right? Yes. You didn't say capitalism, you used capital. Yes. And I would like at, at the end as well to ask you why that uh, avoidance. But the idea is that the first part, let's say in the 40s, with international style, there was a certain language created that was the, that was the capital architecturally that could play, could prostitute itself together with the capital, right? Then we had the surface, that was the sign. Um, then we established the whole idea, uh, um, then we had this, uh, okay, which, was the, which was the third one? Junk space. Junk space. And then we have the fourth one where now you identify that we have this little uh, hyper dark surfaces right. or super sheds. Um, and for me what is interesting is that like maybe 10 years ago we were asking what is political and what is not political, right? And we are actually about everything is political. So we asked what is Zeitgeist and what is not Zeitgeist and everything has its own Zeitgeist. I mean you could not say that an architecture is not the representation of its own time. At the end it always is. And uh, so my question is at the end if we try to find translations in architectural terms of what is uh, the Zeitgeist or what is the thing that we can play with capital, and now you come with your proposal, this idea of rhetoric, my question is how does rhetoric play with all these four different architectural elements? I don't have the answer. <laughs> okay. And so That's, I'm not here for answers, I'm here for questions. So then the second question, how is rhetoric different from narrative? Well, um, I think that I, I can't, I'm certain if we had Wikipedia here and we looked up rhetoric, and rhetoric is a style of argumentation. It is 
it is involved with metonymy, with met, uh, with metaphor, with synecdoche, with all of the tr the tropes of of language. All right, the tropes of language are not the narrative; they are the means by which narrative is deployed. So, narrative is the the say the meaning. Rhetoric is the tropes. The style of rhetoric is basically a style of argumentation, right? And so, what I'm interested in. I, I think I know what the style of argumentation could be today. Uh, what is it, what are the tropes one would use, and therefore what are its, what does it look like? In other words, if a student goes away from this lecture and knows what anything looks like, they're in trouble. Because uh, it's not meant to say I know what it should look like, because I don't think we do know. Uh, but I do know this, I, I disagree with one of the points that you make, uh, is that um, when Leon Creer does a classical building, or Dimitri Porfirio's, um, uh, and he does it, let's say, in a dormitory at Princeton, let's say, uh, Ava, I would argue that that is not a zeitgeist argument, that is a genius loci argument, if there's any, if there's to be any different. And that Princeton d desires that because it doesn't want to be seen as a zeitgeist place. It wants to cover up the fact that they're gays and lesbians and communists and all kinds of perverted mentalities, that they're not old tigers with the same stripes. Oh, they, they, they're actually old tigers with twisted stripes now. Uh, because you can do that with a computer, you twist things. Um, and in order to get money out of these people, their rhetoric is that we must have a campus that looks like nothing has changed. That is the strategy of building, whether it's through Venturi, whether it's McKinnell, whether it's Dimitri Porfirius, the strategy, with a few exceptions, like Frank's building or whatever. But basically, it is to make it look like Nothing has ever changed here. And when it comes to the largest project, I mean, Rice is a very interesting uh, mutation of, of Princeton, and of course, we know that it, it does model itself uh, as Princeton modeled itself. Uh, uh, it certainly wouldn't be as radical as having a Dimitri Porfirio's dormitory here. That's for sure. Uh, I mean, they would have a Michael Graves dormitory, uh, but not a Dimitri Porfirios. And, and so we're not talking about zeitgeist in that sense. I mean, Michael is more of a zeitgeist architect than Dimitri. Dimitri is a genius loci architect. So um, uh, I, th I think we can explain the problem through the terms that I've laid out. I don't think we can necessarily solve the problem or understand how do we prepare young students, which is all of our role, uh, to uh, move on to do that, whatever that might be. And I think it's not a question of talent. I think all of the architects, I mean, when I have a debate with a Rem or a Michael or a Rafa Moneo, what encourages me about these people is not their particular work, uh, but their particular intelligence about their discipline. Their, their understanding of their discipline, their understanding of its limitations, of its possibilities, of its practices, etc. And to me, whether it's Venturi, whether it's Monea, etc., uh, I think that's, uh, I think, very important. And, and the discussion that Rafa and I had on Saturday or the, uh, before on Thursday in a, in a class that we did together, uh, I asked him why was his Counter-Reggio project a Zeitgeist project? Because it's a Hilbersheimer project as opposed to Merida, which is a genius loci project, and Rafa is Mr. Genius Loci. And you, you ask him, well, why? And every time he tries to move out of genius loci and into Zeitgeist, like in his Columbia building now, um, in the Prado uh, extension, he gets himself into huge trouble, right? Uh, and you understand that each of us can operate within a certain intelligence and a certain discipline. 
And what I like about Rafa is he's willing to admit uh, at a certain level where the limits are. And, and I think the same for Venturi, the same for Graves, the same for Rem. Uh, I find it very provocative. I don't know if you've read the, the little AA book with Rem and myself. Uh, and I, I think the, the it's, it's very telling, uh, these two positions. We could do the same thing with Moneo and myself, with Rem and, you know, any number of people. But there are a limited number of people who, because of their education and their desire to learn, have placed themselves, not because of their uh, talent necessarily or because of their intelligence, because of their desire uh, into a position. And these are the people that are in this, they wouldn't be in this room tonight if they didn't have that goal, that possibility. And that's who I was talking to, not offering them answers, but challenges to their uh, situation that they find themselves in. Other questions? Yeah. In your discussion of genius low side, um, can you speak there, up just a little bit? Sorry. In your discussion of genius low side, there's, a, um, there's sort of two uh, types of genius low side going on right now in, the, um, in this kind of commodification of it in a sense, which mm -hmm. is, you know, there's this authentic Princeton, that idea, but there's also with global capitalism and this scale issue that we're talking about, this right. kind of city field, this exporting of Place. No and, question. And so it doesn't relate anymore to any any place. Any place. It can be whatever type of place you want to you want to project. Right. And so do you think that's an important gap to, to talk about in terms of what it used to be versus what it means now, or does it all is it all encompassed in the same definition? I, I think you hit I thought that's what I'd like to think your question suggests that that was what I was talking about that that gap, that we face this enormous gap. I mean, Liz Diller made a presentation on, on Saturday where she showed three Venices, one in Macau, one in Las Vegas, and one in Venice, right? And, uh, you know, uh, every corporation wants now a, a Venice, right? And that, that's what people want. Uh, and the Macau one is an amazing thing because uh, it's deployed in front of, well, I think, the largest hotel in the world. Uh, uh, and I remember Macau, you see. Uh, now, I'm not saying we should leave it there. I took the night boat uh, from Hong Kong, the, the side-wheeler boat from Hong Kong to Macau in 1956 and went to a Fantan Parlor and played Fantan. And I remember opium dens that I was in. I mean, you know, the real Humphrey Bogart film noir. I thought I was Humphrey Bogart. Now, I'm not talking about that's what we want to do. So what do you do in Macau? I mean, I am in a competition right now. And Sarah said, what a wonderful competition. And I'm thinking to myself, what the hell am I supposed to do for a parliament building in Abu Dhabi? Well, first of all, the idea of a parliament building is already colonial because only colonies have parliament buildings, number one. And here we're talking about a parliament building in a colony that never was, was a nomadic uh, culture. So how do you make whatever uh, is symbolic because it's supposed to be a symbolic building? Uh, what do we make, minarets and, uh, you know, OG arches? I haven't a clue how to do a parliament building in Abu Dhabi. I honestly, because there ain't no place there. Um, and so it's a real conundrum. I mean, I would never even give it to a student audience because I don't know how they would be able to learn from doing a parliament building in Abu Dhabi. I don't know how they would attack it. Uh, it would be, so we're faced with these kinds of, uh, of projects today. I mean, we're in another competition doing a Victorian Albert Museum in Dundee, Scotland, right? I'm going to see the site. They say, oh, you've got to come and see the site. I said, I'm not as genius loci architect. I want to have to see the damn site. The damn site is in London, the Victorian Albert. Why are we doing one in Scotland, right? Uh, why are we marketing this thing? Why don't we call it the Dundee Museum of Art? Why is it the Victorian Albert? Because it's got a, a logo, because it's got a brand. 
etc. So we're involved in both of these projects with the this this condition that we find ourselves in. And I don't know the answer. Albert. Um, I'm, I'm surprised that the genus loci Lott. elements of Santiago. Yeah, me too. <laughs> topography. Yeah, stone, me, me too. Craftsmanship. Yeah. Is that, I mean, you're a zeitgeist guy. Supposedly. <laughs> what, what's going on? <laughs> Albert, uh, I long ago gave up being in analysis, so uh, maybe I shouldn't have. Don't forget, is, you have is, to understand, I'll tell you why. Let, let me tell you what my analysis did. Uh, at a certain moment, Manfredo Tafuri wrote an essay about uh, the meditations of Icarus, and Peter Eisenman was Icarus who wanted to look into the heavens, look into the sun. And he got too close to the sun, and the wings melted, and he fell to earth. At a certain moment, I was doing House 10, uh, uh, which was somewhat of a pl first time on a sloping site and dealing with a, a real site. And I decided uh, when House 10, the client said, you're not interested in this project. You're interested in the heavens, right? not the reality of the ground. It's the first time I had lost a project. It was a huge project, I wanted to build it. And I went into analysis uh, for 20 years. And going into analysis, my analysis said, Peter, you are not in touch with the ground. You're not in touch, you're a head person, you live in your head, and in all of my early houses, my early work was all this. And Canareggio was the first project that dealt with the ground and coming to terms with being grounded, in other words, my psyche, and allowing that to be part of my being. So I would argue, Albert, honestly, that as a result of my analysis and the, the residue of my analysis, I have done a series of projects from Berlin uh, to uh, Wexner to, so all of the projects dealt with coming out of the ground, right? And so I would say that Santiago is a culmination. That's the end of that line, but I, I understand it very well. Uh, for me, it's not the beginning of something. It's the end of something that began in 78 in Canareggio. So I would argue it just the reverse, that it is the most genius loci of all the projects. That, that, a, that was going to be my comment, that yeah. in many ways it is trying to deliver a genius loci to, that, that's an alternative to the many Venices all over the place. Right. By looking at topography, material, craftsmanship. Right? And also it looks at the, the metaphysical, it has that, don't forget, the lines, the, there is the story of the discovery of Santiago that the Druids drew lines on the world and that these lines led them uh, with the stars. That's what Compostela means, the field of stars. The, the star, the, the eastern star led them, as it were, these pilgrims to finding uh, St. James's coffin. And the reason why, for example, the seashell the, the scallop shell, the Co Coquille Saint-Jacques, and that's why it's called Coquille Saint-Jacques, was that when they found this coffin with the remains, it had all of these uh, scallop shells on the coffin. And Jewish nobles in the first century were buried in coffins with these uh, uh, Coquille shells. And so they knew it was an original coffin that was brought by the Crusaders back to, and they assumed it. I mean, uh, I mean, there are so many Santiago's that, in the Bible that you find it difficult to know. James the Elder, James the Greater, whatever. Uh, but that's the, the, so there is a, an element in this project of the, of the metaphysical and the mystical, which, uh, is not merely topography, the ground, etc.
Christopher, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, just to follow on from that. Um, Loud enough for all those people back there to hear you? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's not so much a question, but... Uh, Whatever. <laughs> uh, I, I'd be interested in your speculation on, um, I guess, the elephant in the room, uh, both in this image of this project uh, at this school. What is the elephant in the room? That's it. And, and, is there an and elephant? I guess the city. Is that, and that's the relationship between architecture and landscape. As a... As a, you know, the most architecture uh, landscape is something that seems to be, uh, as a discipline, traditionally invested in genus loci, mm -hmm. which now seems to be embodying a zeitgeist or attempting to, uh, to some degree, by appropriating modern architecture's commitment to zeitgeist planning in some ways or operations or performance. So what is is that that the, the elephant in the room and well, the I just, comment? I wonder, could you speculate in, in the idea that... I don't believe, so I, I find it hard to think that in terms of, and, and my building is ground becoming figure, okay? And the idea that I got, where I got that idea was from the Campo Marzio. Whereas all of the genius loci guys took the Campos Marzio and the Noli map of Rome as their uh, mantras, right, and and Roma Interrota, which is the uh, lo, genius loci play, uh, project of all genius loci projects, um, used these maps in uh, 1978. Don't forget that, I mean, I, I didn't pair them, but Roma Interrota was the same time as 10 projects for Canareggio. And one was clearly a, a supposed to be a genius loci project, and one, and one was supposed to be a zeitgeist project. And the zeitgeist architects, there was uh, Hader, there was Abraham, there was Rossi, there was Eisenman, Hursley, the original Corbu uh, follower, and there was Moneo, who does a zeitgeist project. And so the people doing projects in, and there was, the first Eisenman genius lo uh, a ground project, let's say, if you want. Uh, I mean, everybody else, Heidegg did 10 Towers, Raymond did some craziness. Uh, I mean, you can't call Raymond's excavations genius loci. But then there's a difference, I would argue, between Noli's map of Rome, which is genius loci, and the invention of Campo Marzio, which is, as, uh, in a sense, uh, about time, about the fragmentation of time, because there are five or six different times, different scales. I mean, it was a different kind of map than had ever been made before, as was Noli's, as was Buffalino's before it. So the question of landscape and architecture and the, and the figuring of ground, which is what, in a sense, Piranesi did, I would like to think has been a project of mine ever since my analysis. Uh, now, I would never say the figuring of ground is the elephant in the room. By the way, if it's an elephant, it's a tweeny weeny little elephant uh, that you can pat. Uh, I've, never, I've never seen it as a disease spreading around like wildfire, not from what I see uh, in the buildings. I mean, you know, uh, when I look at some of the architectural confections that uh, populate this world uh, in the magazines and reality, uh, there, uh, you know, for me, the present situation is a, is a big problem. And that's why I turn uh, to literature, to art, to film, where I find uh, sustenance in, in uh, considering the, the conditions of our time. And that's why I would, if I'm an architect, I want to send everybody to see White Ribbon because it deals with a problematic of today in a very articulate way. Um, I think there are books that I would, uh, you know, if, if um, I'm an American, um, you know, and I assume most of the students are, you know, from Texas, etc. 
you know, uh, I, 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 well, I'm, I'm in here in Houston, so maybe I shouldn't make that assumption. I would read Dennis Johnson's uh, book, uh, you know, The Tree of Smoke, which is a great American novel. It's 800 pages long, uh, but it tells you something about the, the immediate past uh, of our history from 1968 to 1990, let's say, was, is the time span of this book. And Tree of Smoke is one of the great books of our time. Dennis Johnson is one of the, I mean, I think he's an American novelist, okay? Uh, and uh, we're talking about people who are going to be American architects, whether they like it or not. So uh, I, I would have thought reading this book or having a knowledge of somebody like that is really important. I mean, he is post pension, uh, post Vonnegut, po you know, he is the, the next incarnation. Uh, and if you, you know, if we were reading, uh, you know, Faulkner and we're reading, if we go Melville, Faulkner, uh, you know, great novelists uh, to pension, I would say Dennis Johnson comes pretty close to being the, ne the, the equivalent to what these people's next, the generation of people who will produce an author. And I think it's necessary to bring cultural history uh, to the present, both in film and literature, in art, uh, you know, there's a lot of very interesting painting going on. Uh, Let's see if we have one last question. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the capital which you um, presented as sort of the third category? What would you like to know about capital that I don't know? Is it, since the other two, you know, look at there's place and, and time. And time. Is capital? Capital has taken these two issues and use them to expropriate itself and to move itself in a way where it has become uh, almost unseen uh, a media monopoly, a, you know, a, a project, I mean, in other words, it has influenced our discipline in a, in a radical way. Uh, uh, it is inf infants filmmaking. I mean, just look at, I can't bear to go to Avatar, okay? You know, I mean, because Avatar is, I suppose, uh, the algorithmic architect, you know, uh, personified. But the story is so stupid, you know. I mean, it really is a dumbass story. And, you know, I mean, look at the, the pictures that are up. The friendly Mr. Fox. I mean, you know, God, help me, you know. I go home and watch my Godard. I mean, you know, but I'm a troglodyte. I mean, I suppose all of you think Avatar is great. Uh, but that's what, it's taken over film, it's taken over museum shows, I mean, it's taken over our profession, I believe. And uh, if the, the Venturi of today went to Las Vegas, let's say, let's say you're the Venturi of today and you go to Las Vegas, you don't need to go to Las Vegas because it's all over the place, right? It ain't as, I, I think it's a disease. It ain't a disease anymore that's just confined to Las Vegas. It's all over. So uh, what would you do? I mean, just think. What is your coming to terms with capital? Denise and Bob drove down the strip at Las Vegas, right? In 1972. We're now in 2010. Where would you go as an architect to come to terms to make a project like that, which is definitely a fantastic project, whether I agree with it or not, definitely a seminal project. You're sitting there, you're asking me a question about capital. What are you gonna, what would you do to have that impact, to make that project or that book? I don't think you know. And I certainly, as a teacher, who would love to help you out have no clue either. And I ain't sure that any of your other teachers do either. They may, I'm, I, I, but uh, it's a real problem because we haven't realized to the extent that all of us have become involved in this project without necessarily wanting to. 
I mean, look, Obama tonight is going to have to give a populist talk. Now, if there's any guy that ain't a populist, is he made his, you know, the editor of the Harvard Law Review ain't a populist. But the people don't like editors of the Harvard Law Review. They think those are the guys that have befuddled us and then got us into this mess, made us buy a house that we don't want, a car that we can't have, you know, et cetera, have, have, have corrupted us because the Harvard Business School and they they beat the system. The Harvard Business School corrupted the system with these uh, trading air, right, and, and practically brought the world down. Uh, those guys won. And now the people are not happy, you know, and they're saying, we don't want those guys running the show. We don't want them telling us what to do. We want Sarah Palin, uh, who doesn't know anything, to tell us what to do because she knows how to cook at home and run her household and is, you know, was a governor of a dumb state, excuse me, and, uh, uh, or a dumb governor of a state. And that's the mood of the people. And Obama is going to give a populist talk tonight. Now, what a sadness that that's what's happened in our country in one short year. That's a real sad. I mean, when we lost the Massachusetts ex election, I say, do Democrats have no political instinct? Do they not know what, what the world is like? Uh, because this bobo that they put up and, you know, Mr. Nude America who won, you know, with his daughters for sale, uh, uh, I mean, you know, where are we? And I find myself, but there's where I want to tell you there's hope because at my age, I've lived through many of these, right? And somehow we survive. The union survives. Texas will remain in the United States. Uh, uh, and, and everything will turn out all right. Okay, that's the message of my book that I'm writing, that crisis, uh, perpetual crisis is no crisis at all. And there is no crisis right now. It may seem like one. Uh, back in 1970, there was an economic crisis. I remember in 82, when I started my practice, there was an economic crisis. Uh, you know, uh, when I was born, there was an economic crisis. Uh, you know, there will always be an economic crisis. It's part of the cycle of, if you read my book that Sarah's doing, it's part of the game, right? Uh, capital needs crisis to survive, okay? And the question is, how do we respond? And you all don't have the job that Obama has. What you've got to do is, how do you make architecture that doesn't cater to this populist, uh, know-nothing sensibility? I think it's very difficult to do. Uh, but if you, it's hard to turn your back on it because those are clients, right? And so what are we teaching and what are we learning and what are we doing and how do we learn from the mistakes that were made just this past year by President Obama? And uh, I think that's, we're not economists, we're not politicians, uh, we're architects. Uh, my question to you, to everybody in this room tonight was, if you had a pencil and paper, what would you draw? Where would you go to learn about what to draw? Uh, you wouldn't go to Las Vegas, that I know. But where would you go? And why would you go there? And what would you draw? Think about it. Thank on you. That, on that provocation, thank you.